mentioned my name is Buddy Feneff, and I'm the um, owner of Feneff Funeral Homes and Crematorium here um, in Manchester. We operate two funeral homes, and we also own and operate a funeral home in Boston and in Littleton, New Hampshire as well. And we have a sister company called the Cremation Society of New Hampshire. So as I mentioned, we operate two companies. We operate Feneff Funeral Homes and Crematorium, which is really our what we call our full-service local provider four locations in New Hampshire area, serving a wide range of services from traditional funerals to simple cremations, uh, people that are interested in anatomical body donation with medical schools, uh, families that pass away out of state, we have to make those arrangements. So your traditional funeral offering a wide range of services. And our sister company, which we started um, in 1995, is the Cremation Society of New Hampshire, which is a provider of very simple, low-cost cremation services for families that are really interested in, in doing a lot of things on their own. So our two brands combined, uh, both of our companies last year serviced about, uh, about 1,800 families in New Hampshire. We're actually the largest family-owned funeral home in New England. Um, so provide a lot of services. Hopefully I can have some insights into some of your questions relative to either our funeral home or our, uh, our cremation society. So let's talk a little bit about funeral planning. And this is going to dovetail perfectly um, into our attorney's talk on advanced planning directives and wills and probates. The two really work um, in cohort together in terms of some of the things that we're going to talk about. So the first question, of course, would be, why would anyone want to pre-plan their funeral arrangements? It's not the most exciting thing to do. Well, a few reasons. First thing is that pre-planning ensures that your final wishes will be fulfilled, whatever they are. Um, our family got involved with funeral service in 1906. My great-grandfather actually started in Nashua, New Hampshire. Um, so uh, I'm a fourth-generation funeral director. We've been in the funeral business for quite some time. And back in 1906, or really even in, 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 in 50 years ago or 30 years ago, there wasn't a lot of choices in, in funeral services. Everyone had a wake. Everybody went to church. Everybody went to the cemetery. There was no, cremation wasn't happening 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. So the major decisions were, gee, how much you want to spend on the casket, what church you belong to, you know, maybe some discussions of, of, of calling hours or visitation times. Fast forward now to 2011, um, we're dealing with a lot of different types of services. We have still traditional funerals. We also have a lot of cremation services. Anybody want to guess last year? Um, what the cremation rate, how many people in New Hampshire were cremated, the percentage of people that passed away? We want to guess? 57%. 57, almost 65%. New Hampshire is one of the highest cremation rates in the country. And we're going to talk about cremation in a few minutes. But that's one of the main reasons is that pe um, people will pre-plan because whatever their wishes will be, they want to make sure that those final wishes are going to be fulfilled. Because if you leave it to someone else to do, they may or may not fulfill your wishes. Maybe they don't know what your wishes are. Maybe they do and they don't believe in what you're, in what you're um, wanting to do. So that's one of the main reasons why people prearrange and pre-plan their services. The second is that it eliminates financial burden. We're going to talk about prices and costs in a few minutes of what makes up the price of the funeral. Uh, but a funeral, even a very simple cremation services, if, if left for someone else, can be a fairly significant financial burden. Um, so again, by properly planning, and that's no different than planning for your retirement, planning for your, um, you know, for, for your later years. Pre-planning really just takes it the next, the next logical step. And it also provides a peace of mind, not only to the person themselves, but also to their family. Um, I met with a family uh, a week or so ago, and uh, the two children came in. The dad had previously passed away, and the mom um, had just passed away, and I sat with, uh, with the two kids, and I said, well, you know what? Your mom had the peace of mind and the, the foresight to get her arrangements done. Now, she did it. She unfortunately never communicated those wishes to her children, so they had no idea. But once I told them that their mom had made all those arrangements, it was almost like a huge sigh of relief saying, oh my God, we were dreading coming in. It was hard enough that we lost my mom. She left us no instructions. She didn't tell us what she wanted to do. And they were just, it just provided just a level of peace of mind knowing that what they were going to do was exactly what her wishes were. And it got the peace of mind of the person doing it themselves. So that's really the major reasons why people um, are interested in pre-planning. And I think most people, if you ask them, it's a good idea because we're, we're a society of planners. We plan everything. So I think pre-planning, again, just takes it sort of the next, the next logical step. So 
What's involved with pre-planning your arrangements? Well, a couple things. The first thing is that meeting with the funeral director. That, of course, could be done at the funeral home. We will go to people's homes and do it anywhere in the state of New Hampshire. Again, we, we service the entire state through our funeral home and our cremation society. Um, we've actually had gone out to dinner with people. They didn't want to go out to their home. We, they didn't want to come here. So we sort of met at a mutually agreeable location. Uh, you can actually even make arrangements off of our website. So there are a lot of venues that you can use to meet with staff members to talk about pre-planning the services. And during that, a couple things that we do. The first thing that we do is we will spend a lot of time gathering information about the person. Because one of our goals and one of our objectives is to learn about the person so we can then make intelligent recommendations based on the person. You know, if I sit there and I ask, what's your name, what's your social security number, what's your address, okay, now that I have that, let me talk about what type of a feeling that makes sense for you. I don't know anything about you, right? So we'll spend time, are you religious? Do you have a large family? What are your hobbies? What clubs do you belong to? What do you like to do? What are you passionate about? Um, any of those things. So we'll learn a lot about the person. And based on those discussions, then we can start intelligently making recommendations based on what the person wants. Or maybe they didn't even realize that that was an option, saying, well, gee, you said you belong to this organization. Um, how about having a memorial service at the park? Uh, we had recently had a service at a lady who was very, very active. Um, with an Arbor Society. So we made arrangements with the park to have a memorial service there. That was perfect representation of a celebration of her life. So we wouldn't have known that had we not had that discussion with the person. So we'll spend all kinds of information in time gathering. Yes, we're going to have to get all the vital statistics so we can do all the paperwork if someone's a veteran or um, different things. But that's the main thing is we gather information then we'll spend some time talking about the type of a service or ceremony that makes sense for them. Are we going to have a visitation with an open casket? Are we going to have a cremation with falling by a memorial service? Are they going to be donating their body to science? Are we going to be doing some combination thereof? So we'll spend a good amount of time talking about the type of a service that makes sense for them. And then based on that, we'll talk about things like caskets and, other, and vaults and urns and other merchandise that will support the services that they want. Uh, we take care of flowers, we take care of monuments, we can take care of the luncheon. So based on the services or ceremonies that make sense for them, then we'll sort of talk about the supporting um, ancillary materials, things like memorial cards and books and obituaries and things to make sure that finalizing the services. So that's basically, in a nutshell, the process of making funeral arrangements. The process is, is pretty much the same whether someone's interested in a full traditional funeral, a simple burial service, uh, a simple cremation. So that's the process. But um, one thing to notice is that we haven't talked about prices because a lot of people think that pre-planning a service means pre-paying for a service. And one really has nothing to do with the other. We have a number of people, many people actually every year that come in and said, you know what, I don't want to pay for anything. I just want to get my wishes down in writing. We also have a lot of people that go ahead and take it to the next step, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute, about pre-funding and things, uh, about why that makes sense. But pre-planning doesn't necessarily mean pre-paying for your arrangements. So let's talk about prices a bit. What determines the price of a funeral? Now, there are three parts. There are service charges, there are merchandise, and there is what we call cash advance items. Service charges, which we'll talk about in a minute, tend to be all the things the funeral home provides uh, relative to their services. And that represents, on average, about 40% of the overall cost of the type of a funeral or service that they want. Merchandise is the things that they're buying. Caskets, urns, vaults, flowers, anything that they're actually purchasing. And then finally, cash advance items that we'll talk about are generally convenience items that the funeral home pays on behalf of the family, that would represent about 20% of, the, of the, the final cost. Now, this is true at our firm, this is true at any other funeral home in New Hampshire, and this is true in any other funeral home in the United States. The funeral industry is actually regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and one of the things that the Federal Trade Commission said, and they did this back in 1984 with something called the funeral rule, they said that Funeral homes, by law, now have to itemize their charges in th under three components. Doesn't mean we have to all charge the same thing. 
So if you go to a funeral home in Michigan or California, they're going to show you prices on their price list. And by the way, you all have our prices on our, um, you know, the brochures that we gave you. And our prices are actually all on our website as well, so it's very easy to, to find them. Um, so not every funeral home is going to charge the same thing, but they have to break out and itemize their charges into those three components. Funeral home charges or service charges, merchandise, and cash advance items. So as we talked about, service charges include the things you normally associate the funeral home doing. Things like transferring the person from when they passed away into our care, or using a, the hearse, or limousines, or embalming if we're having an open casket visitation, or renting the funeral home for a chapel service or a visitation, or in our case where we own our own crematories, the crematory fees. Now not all of our service charges are going to apply, but we'll select those items that are appropriate for the type of the service or ceremony. So those are all the, the service, those are really just a sampling of the types of service charges that, that funeral homes. And again, our brochure, we probably have um, 70 or 80 different types of services that we can offer through our service charges. Merchandise, as we talked about and alluded to, things like caskets and the outer burial container that's required by most cemeteries, that's what the casket goes into. Uh, flowers, urns, we, we have a graphic um, person on site here that does all of our memorial books in cards and puts pictures and puts beautiful things together for services and ceremonies. So those are all the merchandise items and then cash advances are items that funeral homes generally pay as a convenience to the family so the family is not writing out a whole bunch of checks. So for example, uh, let's say someone's going to be buried at the cemetery. Most cemeteries charge a fee for what's called the grave opening and closing, which is preparing the grave site. Um, and of course, if you don't own cemetery property, you have to purchase the grave site as well. Um, most funeral homes will, will pay that on behalf of the family, include it on their funeral home statement of goods and services. Um, things like clergy fees or obituary notices. Everyone realize that, that newspapers charge for, for running obituaries? Charge a lot of money. Newspapers make, that's a huge money maker for for newspapers, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in terms of, of obituary charges. Um, music and any other items that are requested by the family. Someone passes away out of state and we have to pay the airline to transfer them here back to New Hampshire. Now, most funeral you know, homes, when they pay for the cash advances, they will take care of itemizing all those and charge the family what the actual charge is. So if the clergy or minister fee is $150, most funeral homes will say, okay, that's 150. Funeral homes do have the legal ability to mark up those cash advances, but by law, this is across the country, must disclose that on their price list and on their statement. So they have to disclose something that says, we charge you for marking up those items. Our firm does not do that. It doesn't mean that if a firm does, they're, they're, they're doing something wrong or inappropriate. It's perfectly legal to do that. Many firms use that as sort of a, another revenue strategy, but they have to disclose that they're doing that. Um, so if you say, hey, I know my local church only charges $200. Why are you charging us $300? Well, because we charge you for the convenience of us writing the checks to do that. So that's something to be to be you know, careful and, and, and make sure you're aware of when you're looking at different funeral home pricing. So everyone get any questions at all about sort of how, how the, the logic around pricing and the breakout or any questions about? Good, okay. So let's talk about the price for an average funeral. Most people, of course, they, can, you know, they don't want to be perceived as being cheap and say, I want to get the least expensive or they don't want to go overboard and get the most expensive. So so you know, we want to be somewhere in the middle, and the, and the answer to the question is average really depends on the type of a service that you're interested in. So someone that says, you know, we're interested in a traditional funeral for my mom. In our lingo, a traditional funeral is generally a type of a funeral where there's a visitation with the body present, usually some type of a service, usually religious, but doesn't have to be. It could be a humanistic service, followed by burial um, or interment at a cemetery. So here again, and these are our prices, so if you say, oh, I went to such and such funeral home and it was this price or that price, that, that's fine, but I'm just going to give you a sense of what, where we are. Um, about seven to $8,500 for those first two parts, funeral home charges and merchandise. That's an average. Doesn't mean it can't be less, and certainly doesn't mean it can't be more. So for a traditional funeral in our area, that's about the average price. For what we call on the other extreme, a very simple cremation, you know what, I just want to be cremated, I don't want to have a, a viewing with the body present, yeah, maybe I'll have a memorial service at my church or in one of your chapels here after. Prices for that, on the other extreme, can be as low as, actually our price is $19.95, could be as low as a couple thousand dollars, 
um, up to $3,000 if we're, maybe we're adding urns or chapel fees or things like that. But there's things in the middle. Someone may say, well, gee, you know what? Mom wants to be cremated, but we'd like to have a, a viewing first and, and rent the casket and have a service and then have the cremation take place. Um, that would fall somewhere in between. Or someone may say, well, you know what? We're not into cremation, but we don't want to have a, an open casket viewing. Gee, Dad just wants to have a nice graveside service at the veteran cemetery with military honors. So again, no embalming required. There's no funeral home charges for the viewing and the visitation. That would fall somewhere in between as well. So huge, but that gives you sort of a range of, of where we're talking about. We're not, you know, we're not at $15,000. We're not at $500. That's sort of the, the range depending on the type of, of services that people potentially could be, could be interested in. So let's talk about, we, now we were talking about pre-planning. Let's talk about for those families that are actually interested in sort of taking it the next logical step about paying for the services, um, what options are available? Well, we have a couple options. The first option is that you can actually pay for the whole thing. Gee, I want to be cremated. It's 1995. Here's a check for 1995. Um, in, our, in our world, at least the way we operate our funeral home, is once you have pre-funded the arrangements, our prices are locked in whether our services are needed in a week, in a month, or 30 years from now. You actually get a contract to that effect. And a lot of funeral homes are like that. Doesn't mean that every funeral home is like that. The only thing that generally is not locked in is that third category. Remember the cash advances that we talked about a couple minutes ago? Because funeral homes generally don't have any control over what the newspapers charge, what the cemeteries charge. So those prices, although you can certainly pre-fund those, generally are not, are not locked in. So that's, that's the first option. The second option is, of course, we work with a lot of people that are, you know, that whether they be senior citizens or living on a fixed income or maybe have the money but don't necessarily want to dip into their savings. So my sister, Michelle, who we just talked about, um, will work with them to set up a payment plan. Maybe they want to pay over a year. Maybe they want to pay over 10 years or five years. So she'll actually set up a payment plan that makes sense depending on whatever the person's budget is, say, gee, all I can afford is $50 a month, but I want this type of a service, or 75 or this. So she'll actually develop payment plans based on the budget of the person and the services that, that they've selected. And a third option is we can actually use people's existing life insurance policy, whether they cash it in or keep it in place and simply change the beneficiary to the funeral home. So I, we had a lady that came in not too long ago, um, not too long ago this week, and had a $5,000 policy from one of the insurance companies, and it just so happened that her funeral was right around that price, a simple uh, cremation with a memorial service and added on a few other things, and it was around a little over $4,000. We found out that she had a very small $5,000 policy, simply changed the beneficiary to the funeral home, no money changed hands. So she was actually able to earmark those funds at the time of her passing to pay for her funeral. Um, no, the only downside about using life insurance policy is that we can't lock in the price because, of course, there's no money changing hands and the person still owns the policy. I had a, we had a lady not too long ago, well, a few years back, that whether she did this on purpose or whether she forgot, came in and made us beneficiary of her policy. Then a couple years later, decided that she wanted to go to, on a trip to Las Vegas, cashed in her policy, and went on a nice trip. Passed away a few years later, her children came in and said, hey, gee, here's my mom's funeral, but everything is all set, and it says that we're going to be using her metropolitan policy to pay the balance. We called the insurance company, come to find out she had cashed it in three years earlier. So again, just because you're earmarking the money, the person still owns and controls the policy. But it's a, it's a one way that we deal with many people, especially people that want, don't, you know, maybe don't have the funds to pay or don't want to dip into their savings, and the purpose of that policy was to pay for the funeral. You know, we can do that. But you can also do, <clears throat> excuse me, a combination. We have many, many people that says, well, you know what, <clears throat> I want to use my insurance policy for part of this and pay you for the difference because maybe my policy is not enough. Or I want to put $1,000 down because I have that in my savings or maybe that's my tax return and do a payment plan for the difference. Or using all three of those. So again, the options are entirely up to you. They're there depending on what makes sense for that person. It's not it's not a cookie cutter approach. We do whatever makes sense and what's in the best interest of the person. <coughs> so wouldn't I be better off just leaving the money in the bank? Why would I ever pay a funeral home for arrangements? Right? Makes sense? My kids know it's there. They know what it's for. Well, let's talk about that. Number one, 
Are the funds, it, and I just use the example of a, a, a CD at a bank, are the funds guaranteed to keep pace with rising funeral prices? Uh, anybody know what CDs are earning now? Not too much. 1% to maybe more if you, if you really invest it. You know, that was a great option 10 or 15 years ago. We had a seminar um, at our other funeral on the west, west side this afternoon, and a lady said, I remember when I was getting 14% on my CDs. You too, okay. Well, that was great. Historically, funeral prices go up about 3 or 4% a year if you look over the last 20 or 30 years. So if I'm earning 10 or 15 or 14% of my CD or the stock market or whatever, yeah, why the heck would I want to give it to you? I mean, there's other reasons why we'd want to do that, which we'll talk about, but just from a pure investment standpoint, would make sense, especially when funeral prices are only going up 3 or 4%. But nowadays, when funeral prices are still going up 3 or 4% because the price of you know, business insurance goes up, workers' compensation, property tax, caskets, all that other stuff, fuel goes up, funeral prices have to go just to meet the cost of rising like everything else. Uh, so you take a funeral, maybe it's only a $5,000 funeral. Goes up 4 or 5% a year. Let's say you have a CD that's earning 1 or 2% a year. 2% spread, $5,000 a year. Is that $100 a year difference? It's not a big deal, 100. 10 years from now, that $100 difference is now a $1,000 difference. So that $5,000 funeral is now $6,000, but I only have $1,000 less than that in my CD. So now your family is stuck with So that's one reason why people do it is, as we talked about, once you have pre-funded your funeral arrangements or cremation arrangements, that price is locked in forever. It doesn't matter when we need it again. Second, um, not a huge deal now because CDs aren't earning a lot, but as you know, any money that you're, that you're earning, uh, you're responsible for paying taxes, getting a 1099 on any interest and dividends. Special type of a funeral account that we use called the irrevocable mortuary trust the taxes are not taxable to the person. The funds are in a trust, the trust actually pays the taxes, so it's not the individual's problem. This is a big one. Are the funds excluded from an asset base when determining um, nursing home eligibility? Has anyone ever had to deal with putting a, a parent or a family member and going through Medicaid and the Medicaid spend down in nursing homes? Okay. Well, the way it works, and every state is different, but the way it works in New Hampshire is that if someone is, is going into a, a nursing home or assisted living, of course, they're expected to pay for their, for their, um, for their time there. And of course, at anywhere from forty dollars to $80,000 a year, it doesn't take too long to go through someone's savings. So um, that's now we're dealing now with the whole state funding with Medicaid and Obamacare and states trying to balance budget. That's a huge part of the entitlement program in terms of, I'm not going to get into my political viewpoint of that because it's not really relevant for this, but one of the things that happens when you're going into a nursing home or assisted living is that they require the person to what's called spend down. They have to use their own funds before the state will kick in. Now, the funds could be life insurance. You're cashing it in. The funds could be savings. You're using your savings. The funds could be a home. They're going to put a lien in your home, or potentially make you sell your home. So it does not take long to go through someone's assets. One of the few things, and one of the very few things that's excluded for Medicaid eligibility when you're determining nursing home care is funds placed into a prepaid funeral account. It has to be irrevocable. There are certain legal things that we have to do with the paperwork, which we do all the time, so that way we don't jeopardize the funds. But if you're going into a nursing home where a family member is, and they'll say, they'll go back and they'll actually do what's called a five-year look back. What people used to do is say, which I think mom's going to have to go into a nursing home in a year or two, so you know, we're going to move the house out of her name, and we get, she has some money in the account, so we're going to give you know, $10,000 to Jimmy and $20,000 to Susie, and, and that way it'll, you know, it will get sort of um, deplete her funds so when she goes into a nursing home. Well, states caught wind of that. In New Hampshire, they now have what's called a five-year look back. They're going to go back five years to see what you did. So if you took out $20,000 of mom's money and gave it to another family member or moved it somewhere else, they're going to say, guess what? That's still her money, even though she doesn't have it in her account. So it's a big deal. They let you keep up to, I believe it's $2,500 now in your account. So I said one of the very few things that's excluded. So if they say, hey, you know what? She had $20,000 in her account, and we just saw you wrote a check for, for $10,000. Where did it go? Oh, went to the funeral home to pay for her funeral. OK, prove it by giving us the funeral bill. Here it is and prove it that the funds were placed into an irrevocable mortuary trust, which is another document we provide you.
then it's fine. So that's a big reason why people go ahead and pre-fund their services. And then finally, are the funds guaranteed to be used for the services that you want? Um, my kids are young and hopefully that when I get of age they'll listen to me as far as what my wishes are. Um, but when you, money does strange things to people and if they have money in a CD or checking account and they're saying, oh mom wanted this, this, oh you know what, that's great but we're not gonna, we're not gonna honor her wishes because by law, if the funds are prepaid for a funeral, at least in the state of New Hampshire, it is against the law to change someone's prepaid funeral wishes at the time of death. The only way you can do it is through probate court. And of course, most people aren't going to go through that. So if mom or dad or whomever prepaid for a simple cremation, traditional funeral, whatever it might be, and one of the kids or family members said, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to change this. And it can't do it. The state of New Hampshire has really good consumer laws when it comes to uh, people prepaying and protecting their assets. The only person that can do it, of course, is the person themselves during your lifetime or power of attorney. So that's another reason why people don't want to just leave money sitting in a checking or CD because then you're at the whim of family members to make those decisions for you, assuming that, you know, hopefully they will honor your wishes, but at that point, not a legal requirement to do so. So is it a good idea to compare several funeral homes before you preplan? And of course it is, for a couple reasons. The first one is that not all funeral homes are set up to handle the same type of payment options. If you know that you want to use your life insurance policy to pay for your services ahead of time, you want to make sure that that funeral home accepts that. Most funeral homes do, some don't. Or, gee, you know what, I need to set up a payment plan. Well, gee, Mr. Smith, I'm sorry, we don't offer payment plans at our funeral home. Again, some do, most do, some don't. So you want to make sure the funeral home offers that. You also want to make sure that the funeral home is set up to be able to handle the type of service that you want. For example, if you want to be cremated, it probably makes sense to deal with a funeral home that actually owns and operates their own crematory, which several do here in New Hampshire, so they're not subcontracting that out. Or if you know that you want to have a service in the funeral home in a chapel, like this, then you want to make sure the funeral home has a chapel, they're just not taking a room and retrofitting it and putting some folding chairs out and say, okay, now it's our chapel. So again, you want to make sure that the funeral home is, can handle the same types of services. Um, not all funeral homes, of course, are familiar with the same religious customs and traditions. Uh, New Hampshire is a melting, especially southern New Hampshire, has become quite a melting pot of ethnic groups. We're a resettlement community for Bosnians, uh, Congolese. There's a lot of, one of my staff members last year figured out uh, we had served over 30 different ethnic and religions in 2011, um, from you know, things such as Catholic and all the different Christian, to Buddhist service, Hindu services, Muslim services, and variations thereof. So as these, as these folks are, are, are coming here to New Hampshire, they're bringing with them their customs, cultures, traditions, and you want to make sure the funeral home is able and understands what those cultures, customs, and traditions might be, whatever they are. Uh, and true with anything else, not all funeral homes provide the same quality and level, level of service. So those are the reasons why you'd want to compare. Um, so let's talk about pricing. Do all funeral homes charge the same price? Well, the short answer is no, no one charges exactly the same price. But in the same community, prices are generally very close. And I apologize for the slide because it's a little, um, little dark in here. You can't see it. But Remember I mentioned a few minutes ago that the Federal Trade Commission regulated funeral service starting in 1984? And one of the things that they required is to give, require funeral homes to itemize their prices in those three categories. The other thing that they did is they required funeral homes to give prices over the telephone. So it's really easy to compare prices. We've taken it to the next step. We've actually put our prices, as a matter of fact, I think we were one of the, the top, the first three funeral homes in the country to put our prices on our, on our website. So it's really easy. But funeral homes, it makes it very easy to compare. So last summer, I had my, my daughter who was on college break do a summer project and call a bunch of funeral homes and get prices. And I just happened to put three of them up here. So these are three funeral homes in one of our, one of our markets where we have one of our funeral homes. And came up with a price. I told her, I said, you know, pick out this type of service with this type of casket and get a, and get a price them over the phone. So she did. One, funeral home A, the first one, the greenish one, 64.50, the next one 65.30, and the other one 60, about $6,800. So, I mean, not exactly the same, but pretty close. I don't think a couple hundred dollars is really going to make the difference between, well, you know what, we can go down the street to save $200, or we can go in a neighborhood that we've never really gone to. So fairly close, very competitive. <coughs> but what needs to be 
known and understood by consumers is that if you go back from a couple of slides ago, remember the three parts of the funeral? Funeral home charges, merchandise, and cash advances? Well, even though most funeral homes are fairly competitive, not all funeral homes are going to put as much emphasis on merchandise versus services. Some funeral homes tend to mark up their caskets more and have a lower service charge. Some funeral homes tend to mark up their caskets less and have a higher service charge. Again, it's, it's just how they choose to run their business. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. But the risk for consumers is we have a lot of people that come in, maybe they printed a picture of a casket on the internet, or maybe they went to another funeral home and they come in and they actually have a picture of a casket urn and say, this is what I want, how much is it? Well, if you just focus on one aspect of it, you might be misled to make an inaccurate decision. So, and again, you can't necessarily see this, this purpley part here, that's the merchandise, and the green part is the service charges. The red part of the cash advances, those are generally the same for all funeral homes unless they marked them up. In, in our particular case, the three funeral homes that we, we called didn't mark up their cash advances. So let's say you were just focusing on the casket, which is the purple part. Well, you would assume that the funeral home A would probably, gee, they charge the most for their casket. They have to be the most expensive funeral home, or they charge the most for their urn. They must be the most expensive. But the reality is they were actually the less, least expensive. On the flip side, this funeral home here, funeral home C, charged the lowest price for the same casket. They have to be less money because these are caskets, so, but they actually charge more for their service charges and they were actually more expensive. So a smart consumer needs to look at all three parts of the funeral in order to make an educated decision. Everyone get that? This slide's a little confusing and the color is not perfect, but does so everyone get that? Okay, good. So what happens to the money if I, died, if I decide to prepay my arrangements and give it to the funeral home? Well, in the state of New Hampshire, there's only two things that you can do. Put it in a special type of a trust account called an irrevocable mortuary trust in a financial institution. We happen to keep ours at Smith Barney, although any other financial institution works. Or use it to purchase a specialized type of a pre-need insurance company policy. And it's not, tr it's not traditional insurance in that you get a nurse going over to your house and taking your blood pressure and taking you know, samples of, your, of um, different things. Um, it's a company that we actually work with, and there are a number of them that are licensed in the state of New Hampshire, that it's another funding vehicle. We use insurance a lot because, especially people that are doing payment plans, insurance companies are used to sending out monthly or quarterly statements so we can set up payment plans with the insurance company. So those are the only two things in the state of New Hampshire that you can do with that. Place it in a trust or place it into a state-allowed insurance product. There was a funeral director up north that thought there was a third thing that you could do with it, and it's put the money in your pocket and go to Hawaii. Uh, he went to jail for a long time, I think he's out now, and his funeral home got sold. So in New Hampshire, it's a big deal. It's not a slap on the wrist. It's a big deal. People actually, you know, it's, it's something that the state looks at all the time. So because, again, it's not, it's not our money. We're actually, in effect, almost acting as escrow agents for the fund. So it's money that's earmarked for services. So finally, what should consumers do before finalizing a contract? Well, the first thing you should do is request an informational meeting. Call the funeral home, hey, I want to come in, I want to get an idea of different types of services, maybe I want to see the facilities, meet the staff. A funeral home that says, well, you know, we're really busy for that, unless I know you're, you're going to come in and, and really do your arrangements or something, that should be a red flag, because if that's how they're treating the consumer now, how are they going to treat your family at the time services are? So you want to make sure that if you've not used a funeral home before, that they're, they're able to accommodate you by coming in, looking around, no commitment, and no funeral home should ever charge you for just for the sake of an appointment to come in. Uh, matter of fact, that should be part of their standard operating procedure and say, yes, we have family, we'll give you a tour, we'll have you, you know, see some of the staff, seeing our facilities, we can write down different options and prices. The second thing is make sure the funeral home has the flexibility to offer the plan that makes sense. If you want to do a payment plan, as we talked about, you need to be able to do that. If you want to use your life insurance or some combination, make sure the funeral home can do that as well. And insist that the, the funeral is guaranteed in writing not to increase. As I talked about in our case, our prices are guaranteed, of course, not the cash advances, as I mentioned, because we have no control over the, the cemetery. Um, and the reason that's important is because a lot of funeral homes in the United States are owned by publicly owned corporations. Doesn't mean that they're 
A bad funeral home doesn't mean the staff there is not compassionate and caring. What it does mean is that they own thousands of funeral homes throughout the country and throughout North America, and there's a lot of movement. So the guy you're meeting now in the Manchester office may get transferred to the Seattle office and then may get transferred to the Spokane, Washington office. So, you know, 20 years from now, your family saying, well, my mom shook hands with the guy that was here and he said this and that and we didn't need a contract and it was guaranteed, but now you're telling me it's not. That's all well and good, but you want to get it in writing to make sure that um, the person you're dealing with in the future or your family's dealing with fully understands that it's guaranteed in writing, not to increase. And then finally, price is really important, but like anything else, you don't want to make a pure decision on price only. You want to look at the quality of the facilities, the professionalism of the staff, because at the end of the day, your family's not going to remember they spent $100 more or $100 less, but they are going to remember how they were treated. And to me, that's, that's a, a pretty key point. Questions? Anything that we didn't cover that you might have a question to? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Let's say it's a $10,000 policy. Yes. And your funeral only costs around five. Right. What happens to the rest of the money? What happens is, so let's say that you pick out a $10,000, you have a $10,000 policy, your funeral today is five. As we talked about, since no money's changing hands, our prices, of course, can't be locked in. So let's say down the road, um, when you pass away, that $5,000 funeral is now $6,000. But your $10,000 policy is now $11,000. We mark up everything to current price, send in the claim, get paid what we're due, which is $6,000, and then the balance of whatever it is gets refunded to your estate. Or maybe the family says, well, you know what? Gee, my mom didn't pick out flowers, so instead of us writing a check, can we use some of the money for flowers? Or hey, can you pay for the luncheon? Or we never got a stone. So it's, it's your family's, it's, your, you know, it's, it's the beneficiary of your estate's funds but they can choose to do other things or simply just get us. So we're only keeping what we need to pay for the, the funeral at current prices. Yeah, that answer, that? Yeah, the other part is though, when you put your, you know, you put Fund F as your beneficiary, mm -hmm. and you put the second as your, your son or your right. daughter. Right, yeah. Also you can do that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So we would get, again, in that, in that example, instead of the balance going to your estate or whatever, it would go to whomever the second beneficiary, that's, absolutely. That's Yep, the contingent beneficiary. Absolutely. There's different ways of doing it. Yeah. Yep. Yep, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And if you don't uh, do the beneficiary thing and you have an insurance policy, mm -hmm. does the funeral home take care of getting the money from that? We do. do we do, yeah, at the time. So your question to everyone and can hear is, you know, let's say you do have an insurance, but you don't make the funeral home the beneficiary, but at the time of passing, you, you want to use or your family wants to use the insurance policy and the answer is yes we actually work with a company the only the, it's, it's not a problem the, the thing that people need to understand is there's always a timing difference is that insurance companies aren't going to pay you right away it takes you know a month or two to process the claim but we live in a time that everyone has to get paid right away so for example when we post the obituary notice the union leader actually charges our credit card to the obituary when we order the casket, the casket manufacturer charges our account right away, so the cemetery gets paid right away. So our general payment policy is payment is due you know, at some time between the time we make arrangements to the day of the funeral. So we have a company, it's, it's, a, it's a factoring company that will actually charge, it's a nominal fee, they charge 5% of the price of the funeral. So let's say the funeral is $5,000 in your case, and you have a $10,000 policy, um, and we're not beneficiary we actually work with this company that will verify A, the policy is in force, B, who the beneficiary is, and C, that there's enough money in the policy to pay for what we're doing. They'll take a 5% fee for doing that. So in my case, they'll take um, $250, thank you. So they will send us the $5,000, they will keep 250, and in the case of the policy being worth $10,000, they will send a check to this, the beneficiary for $4,750, if I did my math correctly. Yep, and that way the family, there's no out-of-pocket expense for them. They don't have to wait for the proceeds of the, of the insurance policy to come in. Yep. But again, it doesn't lock in prices. It doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're gonna get what you, what you want. Any other questions at all? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned donating body parts. Mm -hmm. What are the criteria for that? There is, let me, let me 
let me answer your question with a better question, or I shouldn't say a better question, an additional part of that question. Um, and then I'll get to your, your question. So there's a big difference between organ donation and body donation. Organ donation is sort of what you put in your license. I want to donate my, or, my, my long bones, my skin, my this, my that. So that has no impact on the ability to do any type of a funeral service or ceremony. The criteria whether you can do it is determined by the New England Organ Bank, which has a facility in Waltham, Massachusetts, depending on, gee, your mom was 99 years old and died in a car accident, and, you know, body is mangled, doesn't have a lot, or it, it all depends, you know, can, you, can they donate cornea? So they, will, they being the, the organ donation uh, facility, New England Organ Bank, will make the determination if you do want to be an organ donor or the family decides that they want to donate um, parts of, of the individual, you know, when their loved one passed away, they'll, they'll work with the family to determine that. So that, that's not saying, yes, you're guaranteed to do this or not in the criteria. It also depends on, you know, the types of uh, how you passed away, were you on any medication, how long from the time of death until they can do the harvesting. So there are a lot of different criteria to do that. And we actually have a link on our website for, you know, for more information through the organ bank. Uh, body donation is actually donating your entire body to a medical school for research. Body donation will impact your ability to do services because if you want to wake with an open casket, we don't have a person to do that because you've donated your body and you can't donate your body after the fact. There's actually, again, certain criteria and time frames that um, in New Hampshire, there's only one, um, there's only one um, entity that you can do that is at, is at um, Dartmouth Medical School. Um, the other thing that's important to understand about body donation is that the individual had to have signed up to be a donor prior to them passing away. The reason being is the medical school and the body donation program at the medical school wants to ensure that it was the wishes of the person, because there is no charge. So basically, it, it, there, there's, no, there's no fee to the family in terms of um, um, you know, funeral expenses. They, they, they bear the cost of that. So they want to make sure the family's not doing it so they don't have to pay for a funeral. They want to make sure it's the wishes of the person. So that person has to be signed up in advance. And there's also not a guarantee that they will accept your body, although I was speaking to a person up there. We actually have a sort of an informal contract. We do a lot of their, their transfer when they have people that are interested in, 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 in donating, and they, they do actually donate. They actually will accept about 75% about of the people on their, on their donor list at the time of, of passing if they want. So it's, it's a very high acceptance rate, but it, you have to pre-register for that in advance. You can change your mind. You don't, just because you say, I want to be a body donor, and you, and you decide you don't want to do it, it's not, you're not committed to do that. So that answer your question. I mean, sort of answered your question. Okay. Any other questions at all? Do they, um, if you sign up and you say you want to do that, they must accept that before? I mean, you don't wait until the person's gone. They, they accept, they'll accept anyone ahead of time. Okay. Now, they have the, you know, they have the right to, based on, again, how you passed away, how long it's been. Well, Mrs. Smith has been in our body donor program for 10 years. She just passed away. Gee, she passed away at home, and it was three days until her family found her, and the condition of the body, so I'm sorry, she can't. So as I said, the people that are pre-registered and signed up, they accept, based on the last few years' statistics from what, what I conversation had, about 75%. So it's a good, a good percentage, but not necessarily everyone. So, and the folks that they don't is a combination of the condition of the deceased at the time of death, is a timing difference, maybe they passed away out of state and can't get here in time, maybe the family changed their mind for some reason. Any other questions at all? Great, okay, well, myself and Michelle will be here if you have any.